Hello, everyone. Welcome to another capsule, International Relations Capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. Today, we'll discuss the controversial visit to Taiwan by the Speaker of the US Congress, Nancy Pelosi. She made a very brief stopover in Taipei, the capital of Taiwan, during her visit to the East Asian region. She went to Korea, Japan, etc. It was a routine visit in those countries, but it turned out to be a rather historic visit to Taipei because it is after 25 years that a senior official of the US administration is visiting Taiwan. Of course, those who know the history of Taiwan is not surprised by this because there has been a huge issue regarding Taiwan's future between United States and China. When the People's Republic of China came into existence, the Chiang Kai-shek government went to the island of Formosa and established a government there. And it continued all these years, even as the People's Republic of China took its place in the United Nations and elsewhere. Taiwan calls itself the Republic of Taiwan, and several countries of the world have recognized it as an independent country. But most important countries consider that they have a one China policy, which means there is only one China. Nobody says, which is that one China? But there's only one China in this world, and therefore Taiwan obviously does not have the kind of recognition it is seeking. It is about 23 million people and is one of the most prosperous countries in that region of the world, though 65 times less smaller uh, than China. So China's, uh, Taiwan's position is that it's an independent nation and it should be recognized as such. And it applies for membership to the UN Security Council every year and is promptly vetoed by China. In the General Assembly, they may get some votes, but in the Security Council, because of the veto, their application for membership cannot move forward. Meanwhile, the Chinese have taken the position that this is part of China in the sense that it was, the though the previous government shifted there, it has no recognition. And they want Taiwan to be reunited uh, with China one day or the other, either peacefully or, if necessary, by war. That is the Chinese position. So this has continued and the status quo was not very unsatisfactory for most countries. Taiwan, even though it considers itself to be independent, has had good relations with, um, with uh, Beijing till very recently, till a new government took over, the present government took over, they are a little more independent, they are, it's a democratic party, and they want to protect democracy, and they feel that if Taiwan joins China, they'll lose their democracy, and uh, so there is a conflict between, say, democracy and autocracy. So, in this situation, uh, there have been talks, there have been rumors, stories about China wanting to do something in Taiwan particularly after the Russia-Ukraine war, because Russia signed an agreement with uh, China for unlimited cooperation, which includes military cooperation, which means that China will support Russia on the Ukraine issue, and Russia will support China on the Taiwan issue. And therefore, there has been a speculation that something may happen. It was in this context that uh, Nancy Pelosi, the third ranking senior most official in the administration made a short visit. Uh, Biden administration says that they were not aware of such a visit, which of course nobody believes, because I do not think that the Speaker of the US Congress can just pick up a military flight and escort itself with a military aircraft and go and land in Taiwan. This is most unusual and impossible. But uh, she went on her own, as it were, and she said that if she was going there because she wanted democracy against autocracy, 
and also to make sure that the people of Taiwan do not suffer on account of any kind of invasion by, by China. And the Biden administration, though it said that we did not know anything about it, and uh, the President Biden also said that there was no way he could uh, stop a U.S. congressperson to travel anywhere. So it's all a myth, but really what happened was that uh, the elections are coming in November for the U.S. Congress part of it. And um, uh, there is a very serious doubt as to whether the Democratic Party will win the majority. And if it doesn't win the majority back in the U.S. Congress, uh, Nancy Pelosi will cease to be the speaker. And therefore, this is one theory that she wanted to go there for a last hurrah for the people of, the, of uh, Taiwan before she herself gives up her speaker's gavel in uh, November. But the more plausible theory is that the Biden administration and the Democratic Party also need some kind of a boost after the various failures they had. Afghanistan was a disaster. It was a even bigger, bigger disaster was the pandemic and the Ukraine-Russia war. In all this, though, Russia has not won the war, but there are signs that NATO is losing ground. And uh, since NATO is not really fighting, but only supporting Ukraine, there is some uncertainty about it. So in all these things, they are likely to be punished at the elections and Democratic Party might lose. And for fear of that, they decided to gain some leverage by supporting a cause which many people in the United States advocate, that is, Taiwan should remain independent. So that is a signal that uh, they gave, even though President Biden told President Xi Jinping in, the, in a message, in a conversation, uh, that uh, he was not, uh, he did not intend that Nancy Pelosi should visit Taiwan at this stage, uh, but he could not have stopped anybody from visiting any congressman, one from visiting other countries. So it is a bit of, uh, uh, you know, but lack of clarity there. But nobody else has any doubt that this was deliberately done in order to gain some popularity for the uh, Democratic Party. Of course, Nancy Pelosi is known for her sympathy for uh, Taiwan and also her opposition to Beijing and also for democracy. So she said that she had come there to make sure that the, that the Taiwanese people do not lose democracy for fear that there could be an invasion of Taiwan, and that would be the end of democracy in that part of the world, which is of great concern. In fact, uh, the United States has now taken upon itself the, uh, the, the role of protecting democracy around the world. There do not seem to have any other slogan to spread. And uh, democracy is the, is the weapon they are using in order to gain support and sympathy from other countries. Uh, of course, uh, uh, as, as, uh, Speaker Pelosi uh, met various leaders and she made certain speeches and she was quite uh, modest in her demand. She never asked for freedom for Taiwan. She basically mentioned that uh, the people of Taiwan should not be uh, punished put to any uh, disadvantage on account of this. And she repeatedly said that America is uh, you know, committed to support Taiwan in its independence. Of course, the theory whether this is really a military contract or not is not very clear. There is certain uh, ambiguity about uh, the position of the United States. They have not said they will wage a war if necessary, but they have said that they are committed to protect and safeguard uh, the, 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 the democracy in, uh, in Taiwan. So, and that uh, lack of clarity is now become kind of a confusion uh, because nobody knows exactly what the American position is. But everyone knows that if China and Russia uh, invade uh, Taiwan in some form sooner or later, the United States will certainly be on the side of Taiwan and will have to be ready to fight a war, which will be a major war, it will be a global war, it will be a nuclear war. So this is something that uh, nobody wants. Uh, China reacted violently, flagrantly against this visit. They could have simply said, oh, what does it matter if the speaker visits uh, Taiwan? 
But they said that this is, uh, called it uh, Pelosi terrorism, that is landing up in a military aircraft in Taiwan, and making speeches, which even at one point, maybe by mistake, referred to Taiwan as a country, which was also read uh, with some concern. So what they did was they immediately reacted, not by not against the United States as such, uh, but campaigning, uh, having a drill, military drill all around Taiwan, completely surrounding Taiwan, uh, aircraft, jet, jet aircraft, and the warships surrounding Taiwan, getting close to the median line, and uh, generally threatening. And for the first time, jet fighters flew over Taipei. In a, in a threatening mode. So they said that this we will not allow and uh, we will uh, you know, meet it militarily. And to demonstrate that, they showed all their power uh, without purpose firing on anything, but simply flying over these areas, making it difficult uh, for people to have a, have a normal life. And they, did, they made it very clear that this will not be accepted and uh, that uh, they should be, you know, she should apologize for it, or the U.S. should do that, etc. None of that was, uh, that was available. Uh, but uh, the message was loud, loud and clear that if anything is done uh, militarily, Taiwan does anything militarily, there will be consequences. So we still have the status quo, except that there is a constant danger. After four days, China has slowed down its military drill, etc., and the normalcy is slowly returning to the island. But there is no doubt that this was a demonstration on the part of uh, United States that they are back in the, like uh, President Biden went to the Middle East, um, like that they are kind of showing that we are here and we are not gone anywhere and nobody can take us for granted in spite of the weakness demonstrated by the United States. So in a way, President Biden is getting a way to uh, formulate a China policy. They are not really formulated a China policy, he was dealing more with Russia. And since Russia and China have come together, it has become more urgent for the United States to take a position. And, uh, and this visit helped uh, President Biden those saying that Nancy Pelosi did not go under her instructions. And even the US Army had said this was not the right time uh, for her to visit. And the meaning of that is that uh, President Xi Jinping is about to take over an unprecedented third term of office as president, which will make him president for life towards the end of this year. And so it's a crucial moment for him. So he cannot be, cannot appear to be uh, in any way weakening while he is being uh, thrown, enthroned as the as, as a president the third time, which has not happened in the history of China before. So there is no su surprise that China reacted very vigorously. Uh, but what is the result of all this? Uh, is basically that both sides have asserted their position, uh, but no movement. But if you really look at the situation in Taiwan today, the status quo is fairly satisfactory for everybody. For Taiwan, they are enjoying freedom to do what they want, like a country. They are not restrained in their sovereignty of action. And in some institutions, they have even, uh, though they are not a member of the, of the United Nations, uh, they represent uh, Taiwan in the name of Taipei, Taipei China. It's a kind of compromise to enable uh, Taiwan to get support from some UN agencies, etc. So China has also shown some flexibility. So they really do not have much to lose by what has happened. But the fear is there. But the interesting part is the Taiwanese did not show any alarm about the Chinese actions. Uh, strangely enough, they Tourists apparently went closer to the places where Chinese aircraft is flying instead of running away from Taiwan, as people would have expected. So they were going to these spots where the Chinese aircraft were flying and the, and the ships were sailing. They went there as tourists to watch the show, as it were. So there was no anxiety on the part of the, they might have been anxious, 
but they didn't show any anxiety and they thought it was some kind of a show which is uh, worth seeing by the, by the tourists so obviously there is certain comfort level on the part of us and uh, taiwan that you know china might make all this saber rattling as it were but they may not take any action unless the united states take any military action and the united states is no more to do that they were simply assuring taiwan of uh, so and um, and china has very good uh, trade with uh, taiwan taiwan is more prosperous it is the 11th uh, most prosperous country in the world for semiconductors they are the best in the world all they have accomplished and uh, what they nurse what they guard is their their democracy and they are not speaking very loudly about uh, uh, not joining taiwan in fact there are some people some political parties inside taiwan who believe in a peaceful reunification with china so it's a very complex uh, complex matter and from american point of view also the existing situation is not so bad because they are also free to do whatever they want to do with uh, uh, taiwan many countries including india have appointed trade commissioners who actually work like ambassadors and uh, they are very welcome in taiwan and they are buying and selling goods from taiwan so in a sense china taiwan and the united states have real no quarrel with the status quo but none of them will formally accept the status quo so what is the solution well there is no solution to be found one solution was suggested at some stage that uh, taiwan could become like hong kong uh, becomes part of china but retains its democratic system one state two systems uh, model of course this has been rejected by all sides and there is no active proposal for this but since uh, nancy pelosi did not speak about independence for taiwan and only about democracy so the possibility of taiwan becoming a part of china for all practical purposes but remaining a uh, kind of independent in its uh, economic activities which would be beneficial to the world and uh, that kind of a suggestion has been made and some people suspect that this is being suggested in a sense by nancy pelosi's visit but there is no evidence of that and only some of us feel that that may be a better way to deal with the situation but china certainly wants it to be a fully part of china and even in the case of hong kong they have gone back on their promise that they will allow hong kong to function as a democracy uh, increasingly china is tightening its hold down on, on hong kong that we that we know particularly at the time of the pandemic this became very very clear so two things have happened as a visit of uh, nancy pelosi if she had inadvertently you know fired a, uh, you know a first first shot of a war that's quite possible but this may eventually lead to a war and nancy pelosi may have lit the fire in taiwan that is one theory and uh, then people compare her to helen of troy you know when helen of troy was responsible for battles and um, there is this uh, famous line in uh, marlowe's play called dr faustus where uh, you know helen of troy appears as an image and um, you know faust exclaims was it the face that launched the thousand ships and burned the topless towers of ilium you know such a face a face was so extraordinary that men will be willing to fight wars in her name and that was her reputation but uh, helen of troy has been uh, pictureized in different forms in different forms of literature in some forms she is a kind of of an instrument a willing instrument in the hands of uh, kings and commanders on the other hand people believe that uh, she may have just uh, you know affected them so much that they are willing to them inside so whether nancy pelosi is a helen of troy which has caused the war or is she an angel of peace who has who is likely to bring about a compromise on the question of taiwan this remains unclear and uh, but none of them has anything much to lose 
in the in maintaining the status quo. So if this fizzles away as a non-event, it is good enough for everybody, but at the same time, it will be very difficult for them to withdraw from the post just there. At least it will take some time. And unless there is clear evidence of Russia winning the war or the Americans becoming in desperate and wanting to do something to gain the lost ground in the world, it is, remains to be seen. So on the whole, it created a big sensation. It created a sense of danger. But the way that the Chinese reacted very violently, the Americans pretended as if they did not know. And, um, and the Taiwanese were quite relaxed. Of course, the leadership was saying that this is something against us. But in actually, they did not do much. And they thought this was a very nice show to watch. So that is the situation. So it remains to be seen whether she is a heroine, she's a kind of Helen of Troy, or from, on whose account countries go to war, or she went there to give this message that as long as democracy is maintained in, in Taiwan, uh, maybe some adjustments would be possible. So this is, the, this is the story of what happened during Nancy Pelosi's visit. The things have died down, but uh, the Chinese have repeatedly said that this is not going to be over. They will continue their uh, military drills, uh, both on the, the sea and in the air, periodically, even if nothing else happens. So the situation has not made anybody more secure. It has not made China more secure. It has not made the United States any more secure. And nor has it made Taiwan's life easier. So. Why she did that is a matter of question. Why was she allowed to do that? It's a matter of discussion. Uh, but these are the issues, and there is no clear answer for that as of now. Thank you very much. Well, this is kindly that's a kind of countering the uh, you know loss of face that NATO has suffered on account of the the the, the tactics that they used against Russia. Uh, they didn't think that Russians will go to this, this extent. They thought it would be a short war. They could manage it by sanctions and by the army and, so, and by the uh, supply of material to uh, Ukraine. And that has not happened. And therefore, they are at a loss as to how to sustain the momentum in Ukraine. And uh, Russia is more or less gaining ground there. And so they may have deliberately done that. Whether it is right or not is another question. Taiwan has a history of we having been part of China. Uh, but uh, there are the, the vote in favor of the United Nations uh, take United Nations place in the Security Council being taken over by public People's Republic of China rather than uh, Taiwan, which was there till uh, the 70s. Um, that was not a unanimous vote. So there are still about 30, 40 countries, countries in the world who believe that Taiwan has an independent status that we cannot ignore. And uh, they are sustaining itself. The China is sustaining its position because of the veto just as Russia is sustaining its position on Ukraine by using the veto. So the weakness of the United Nations on account of the veto in coming to a proper decision on these issues is still glaringly there. So, but to most of the countries, in fact, like you, are sympathetic to China for what the United States has done or what Nancy Pelosi has done. They think it was foolish, it was unnecessary, they have nothing to gain by this, etc., etc., but that is the opinion. But the Chinese have a little bit become, become arrogant after this. You may have read that the Chinese ambassador in Delhi uh, talked about uh, India not respecting uh, one China policy, and gave some lecture to us. And uh, Ambassador was, uh, Kapil, uh, Kamal Sibal wrote a very strong uh, you know, party, strong article saying that will China follow an India, one China in one India policy? Because they are talking about uh, Oxide Chin as different from China, India. They show uh, uh, 
uh, Arunachal Pradesh are part of China. What does that mean? Is not that a two China two India policy? He has challenged that, you know. And uh, how have they destroyed all the agreements between India and China since 1986 or even before, from Panchil onwards? Everything is off according to China. So we have to draft new rules, regulations, and they are trying to alter uh, the line of actual control. So all these are being pointed out that China is also not being very fair. If they want India to respect one China policy, they should also respect one India policy, not uh, different parts of India being dealt with differently. So there is logic there also. But there are no answers clear and for any of these issues. Yes, that's very clear. The whole uh, BRI is meant to isolate India and to cultivate these smaller countries. But uh, their true color is being shown these days, because like, for example, what has happened in Sri Lanka is a big blow to China. China was considered to be a very, uh, what shall we say, friendly country to Sri Lanka. But now what are they doing? They are just keeping quiet. When Sri Lanka has got into this dead trap and uh, nobody is helping them, it is India which is helping. And you must have seen the recent report that they wanted to send a warship to Abantota uh, in the guise of, uh, you know, replenishing it and, uh, sub, you know, stocking it, etc. And India had to request uh, Sri Lanka not to allow this. And the Sri Lanka has requested them to postpone the visit. And China is making a lot of noise that uh, China has every right to have friendly relations with uh, neighboring countries. And uh, India has no role in it. So there is that tension. Certainly there is. And uh, Taiwan is not in that category. Because in the case of Taiwan, they are simply saying that this is our country. They are not giving any excuses or giving them money or anything of that kind. So that's a more fundamental issue. Uh, but uh, China's intentions are expansionist, certainly in South Asia. And after the Sri Lankan uh, you know, kind of uh, fallout, they have to readjust their policies. They probably have to offer more humanitarian assistance to Sri Lanka and not expect India uh, to uh, repair the damage caused by the Chinese debt trap. And that's uh, obvious. So maybe others will uh, learn their lessons and people will uh, try to turn towards India rather than to China for assistance, etc. But China's assistance was much more liberal, much more generous than whatever we could afford. But at the time of trouble, we have really gone out of the way to, you know, give them something like $4 billion in order to recover. And China has promised $1 billion, but they have not paid for it. Now. So there is a duplicity of China in this regard also. No, I think uh, even at the best of times, uh, Russia, Soviet Union had not supported India vis-a-vis -vis China. You may remember in 1962, their reaction was that one is a brother and the other is a friend. And you know who the brother is and who the friend is. So, and even in 2020, when Ladakh happened, uh, the Russians arranged some kind of a meeting between our foreign minister and the Chinese foreign minister, and they appeared to be trying to help out uh, but with the Afghanistan issue, uh, they have gone back on all that. And uh, now they have left India to deal with China by itself. There is no nothing from the Russian side. But on the cooperation side with Russia and economic cooperation, etc., there has been some strengthening in this, region, in this period. Because we have not condemned Russia. We have continued our uh, you know, economic programs with Russia. In Vladivostok, we have a program and all that. And that's going smoothly. We have got the S-400 missiles. And so the Russians are keeping up the promises in most of these cases, though they're joining with uh, China in a, in a treaty agreement, which is limitless. And that is a major threat to India. So if militarily they are pledged to China, they cannot, you cannot expect uh, Russia to stand by us or support us. Uh, but we have taken a principal position that uh, all wars are, wars are harmful. Nobody will win these wars. And therefore, what is needed in Ukraine is a ceasefire. 
in negotiations. And that's a helpful position for Russia, though they are not willing to have any ceasefire or negotiations. And Ukraine is not too happy with that. And the Western countries are also not happy. Americans feel that now that India is a member of the Quad, it should be more supportive of the United States. But we don't see it that way. So we are successful in balancing it, at least for the time being. When there are serious mistakes have occurred, we even criticized. There was a massacre in Butch or Book. And uh, there was also some uh, uh, bombing of prisoners. In these cases, we have protested very strongly against what Russia may have done. So we are keeping a balance. And uh, we are also not supporting the Europeans in everything. On oil, for example, we are dealing with uh, Russia. We are buying oil from them. And the Europeans are buying, but they are asking us not to buy. So we expose their hypocrisy by saying that you are buying more oil than what are you complaining about. And also our arrangement with Russia for some rupee payment, also they have been questioning. But all this we are not conceding at all. And uh, so I think we have a fairly strong position as of now. Well, I don't know whether we have a backup plan, but we are aware of what is happening and we are doing everything possible to uh, make these countries feel comfortable with India and not tempted to you know, depend on China more. And uh, the recent uh, Sri Lankan example may be helpful. Others may not uh, go the same way. Bangladesh has distanced itself a little bit and other countries may also, some of them may leave the Belt and Road Initiative because they realize that uh, the terms of the Belt and Road Initiative are not very helpful for their uh, self-reliance. So for a mix of, uh, what shall we say, a firmness on the part of our side and also of uh, befriending these smaller countries have passed us dividends. Uh, like you know that uh, Maldives president was in India even though there have been a, there's been a movement of quit India, India quits in Maldives. But he came to India and pledged his support to India and said that India would be at first priority. So both things are being seen. So we are meeting the whole situation as best as we can. A, number, a small number of countries. I was in the South Pacific. Uh, the small countries in uh, South Pacific. And wherever I went, I could not call on the Chinese ambassador because the <laughs> Chinese ambassador was the Taiwanese uh, because Taiwan was giving a lot of assistance to these small island states. And so they had not recognized China and they had recognized Taiwan. But that I believe that was about 15 years ago when I left. And after that, many of these countries have come back to the mainland China and sent Taiwan out. And in fact, mainland China signed a huge contract, huge agreement with uh, Solomon Islands, a small, tiny state in South Pacific. So there are some countries with diplomatic relations, and increasingly, uh, they are also going towards China, because China is compensating them for whatever they're losing in terms of, of revenue. Of course, as, as, as we are concerned, we have trade relations, and we have a trade commissioner in uh, Taipei, my own brother, my younger brother, was the trade commissioner in Taipei till uh, a few years ago. And he was called by them always as the ambassador of India. Though he could not call himself ambassador of India, he called himself trade commissioner. Uh, but in, uh, in, in real, virtual reality, uh, Taiwanese considered these trade commissioners as ambassadors. But that is their own choice. Uh, we don't do much about it. And we don't acknowledge it. So we follow a one China policy, which is that, you know, there is only one China and that we don't say the meaning of that is it is only uh, People's Republic of China and Taiwan is an issue which has to be resolved separately. I know, but as I said earlier, they did not stand by us in the case of China even before. So it is uh, not realistic to expect that. So we have any war, we have to fight it ourselves. But who? nobody will come and fight our war. So what we have to do is to make sure that we are strong enough 
we are prepared enough and we are strong friends that's all that we can do the rest is our our responsibility to fight the war with what we have we have nuclear weapons so it is a deterrent and nobody will dare uh, you know launch a war against india we have a non first use but uh, second use is permissible and therefore nobody is going to attack us with nuclear weapons so there are certain guarantees this way and then having joined the quad a relationship with the us has also been strengthened and that is why us keeps saying you are a quad brother how can you go and support russia to which i reply is that we have not supported russia we only supported peace we only supported dialogue we only supported uh, you know uh, a peaceful resolution of disputes and that is true but uh, americans are upset with this with us and they have made no secret of it and president biden has spoken um, but they have maintained a continuous flow of exchange with us as you know our external affairs minister is very active in answering questions of every any country anyone who wants to ask him questions and he has followed a very transparent policy and also Uh, seeking independence or strategic autonomy which very strongly recommends that they let us decide things on our own and uh, we are not doing so badly so i don't think we need to be very anxious well a mix of all it is definitely a, americans are flexing their muscles showing that they can they will prevent any attack on uh, on taiwan uh but um, there is no such certainty that taiwan will be in the next ukraine because it will not be ukraine will be will like a uh, will be like child's play compared to a taiwan war because china is the second largest uh, nuclear power and russia is the third largest and second and third ganging against the first uh, will be quite disastrous and so nobody will do that hopefully and so uh, this is i don't know whether you want to call it provocation or testing of waters what will the chinese do if we do a b c d and that seems to be the motivation so uh, the what whatever statements they were making china reacted but didn't matter but then there's a second stage where they send a congress woman to make some statements there and the reaction was quite violent but it has died out no war has taken place and so one test is over then a test again but that's a natural thing in uh, national security concerns in uh, in areas like this where there is some uncertainty well the un has failed in this you know we have been saying this for a few days particularly after the pandemic that un has become totally irrelevant in this context because even the pandemic they could not do anything and what can they do uh, to prevent a war among the among three permanent members <laughs> there is no un uh, in place without the permanent members so they have no role at all of course um, UN is the conscience of humanity. Secretary General has a right to appeal for peace, etc., which he does from time to time. But beyond that, what can the UN do? If anybody puts up a resolution of Security Council, even for peace, it will be vetoed by Russia, or somebody will veto it. So UN is totally ineffective. But there are other fora like the G G20 or G7 or uh, SCO. and where there are multiple partnerships india has with different uh, shades of opinion those are the organizations which team seem to be working overtime to prevent a catastrophe because there is no veto in these institutions these organizations so these have been meeting you know there are organizations of russia china india and the us are present but though they don't seem to meet each other uh, sco for example Uh, you know us is not there but everybody else is there uh, but uh, our, our external affairs minister did not meet either the chinese foreign minister or the pakistan foreign minister so uh, we are doing our best but there is no clear way certainly that un has no no role
Well, quite obvious. The answer is obvious in your question. If China is reducing export of weapons and India finds Chinese weapons less attractive, uh, the choice only two, Israel and Taiwan, sorry, Israel and uh, US. And Israel and US is the one and the same thing. They are the same weapons that it is manufactured in USA or, or Israel. And uh, our uh, uh, Chinese imports of weapons has come down from 80 to 70 percent to much less, more like 50 percent. But when you buy the SS-400 missiles, it will go up again, a component of Russian weapons. But it is declining, which is not very good because the, though there are better equipment, better weapons, uh, they are not uh, very reasonably priced. And they don't also often give technology. Because of Make in India program, we are hoping that the Americans will come and jointly explore uh, building of these weapons in India and sell it to other countries. And um, that has not worked very well. And um, so we continue to import from the US. And import is testing your friendship by counting the number of weapons you, you buy. In Saudi Arabia will buy US weapons, but then so the United States forgives them for the murder of Khashoggi. <laughs> that is the policy of uh, at least Trump. So we will increasingly buy weapons, more of weapons from, uh, we will make it ourselves and also buy from uh, US and uh, Israel. Well, it is very hypothetical and unlikely because Pakistan is not going to depend on India more because that our, our hatred towards each other is visceral. So, no, under no circumstances will they give up their friend, friendship with China and depend on India. It's uh, impossible. But of course, if you look at history, you have so many instances of people, uh, you know, changing uh, alliances, etc. It's not impossible. I cannot say it will never happen. But if you look at this relationship between China and Pakistan, it's, a, it's not a fair weather relationship. It is an all weather relationship. Right from the old days. What has, uh, you know, communist country to do with a um, uh, with an Islamic nation. There's nothing in common between them. The only common thing between them was the hatred of India. So we have lived with it. But um, your scenario is not likely in the near future. Nor will China offer any kind of option for Pakistan to move away. In fact, Pakistan has moved away from the United States in a big way. And even in the Middle East, they do not have a great hold. China is their only natural supporter. And why should they give up? They're given the nuclear weapons, they've given them all the support, that is the China-Pakistan corridor. And uh, everything is uh, hunky-dory with them. And uh, therefore, I do not see, because in the distant future, we can argue many of these war games. <laughs> but as of now, logically, and uh, historically, scientifically, we cannot think of a situation like that. In most countries of the world on China policy, but many of them do not even, I don't have a list in front of me, but most more countries in the world, major countries in the world, follow one China policy. It's only some smaller countries here and there which recognize uh, Taiwan as the, as the genuine representative of the people of China. This is, these are big questions for which there is no answer. At the moment, NATO's wish, US wish is to weaken Russia. That's it. Any other things, other things they will wait. So that in the weakening of the Russia process, what um, can the other countries do? So they will go ahead strongly if uh, the resistance, like today we heard that the United States has multiplied, I don't, I didn't see the figure, multiplied support for Ukraine in a big way. The Congress seems to have supported it. So that will grow. And then the only in aim is to make, make Russia weak. And that is our objective, strengthen NATO and weaken 
and they may even sacrifice Ukraine in that sense because they may, may not make that a condition uh, for uh, a peaceful resolution. But uh, you cannot see what others can do in this particular context to uh, save uh, uh, Ukraine or uh, what is happening in, uh, in NATO. Because Middle East is not to be linked with this, because uh, uh, Middle East, uh, US has slightly withdrawn and it is these Russians who are playing a role in Syria and other places. I don't see much comparison between them and this. Why don't no one want to speak about the West atrocities? Well, it doesn't suit them to speak about them. But uh, President Biden's visit to the Middle East was not very successful. Saudi Arabia and others did not do what he asked them to do, that is to increase production of oil so that the prices can be stabilized. Uh, and also uh, keep the trade routes open uh, so that uh, the the inflation rate in the United States can be controlled. But on this, neither of this, the Middle Eastern countries showed any interest. They said they had to deal with Iran, they had to deal with Russia, they had to deal with China, and they'll deal with the United States also. So the primacy of, primacy of the United States in the Middle East has disappeared as a result of the oil boom inside the United States. In fact, they don't read and need uh, Middle Eastern oil anymore. And therefore, and they are in the market for selling oil themselves. So this uh, oil is thicker than water theory does not work good. All the best. Thank you very much. See you next week.